So it's thanks for coming tonight, <coughs> along tonight in spite of the more dreadful Sydney weather um, to be with Joe, Joe Hockey. It's the occasion of the, of the launch date, actually, of his book, Joe Hockey, Diplomatic, Navigating the United States Alliance in the Age of Obama, Trump, Biden, and, and beyond. And uh, Joe Hockey's going to talk on that topic tonight, which I think we have framed as um, reflections of an Australian ambassador to the US during the Trump administration. Now, Joe Hockey is well known to all of you. He makes a welcome return to the Sydney Institute. He's been here quite a few times in the past, so I'll introduce him very briefly. Um, studied arts and law at the University of Sydney, became president of the uh, Sydney University SRC, practiced law, became the member, Liberal Party member for North Sydney in 1996, and served as a minister in the Howard and Abbott governments. Um, ending up as Treasurer of Australia before taking up a position in January 2016 as Australian Ambassador to the United States uh, in a four-year term, which was finished, completed on January 2020. So he was in the United States during a very interesting period. And we're going to hear about that in a minute. But before we do, I should, should also say many thanks to King and Wood Mallisons for the use of this um, very handsome uh, convention room to, tonight. So, uh, Joe Hockey, welcome and uh, good luck with Diplomatic. Well, thank you very much, Jared. Great to see so many familiar faces as well. Although it feels as though it's been some time since I've been at the Sydney Institute. Uh, but uh, it is great to see you, Jared. Uh, can I obviously acknowledge former colleagues like Michael Yabsley and Malcolm Kerr and range of others, but also in particular acknowledge Leo Shanahan, who's here, who also has his name on the front of the book, albeit in smaller print than mine. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, uh, he was, we had an incredible collaboration making this, this happen. Uh, as, a, as a journalist, uh, a former journalist, uh, he loved working late hours. And uh, as a small business person in Washington, D.C., I started my day at 5 a.m., so... Somehow we managed to nut out what uh, I think is a really interesting series of stories and uh, learnings of uh, not just uh, Washington DC, but everything that helped to make it all happen. I first went to the United States as a kid in the 1970s. I was the youngest of four children, and being the youngest, I was the one that was spoiled. Got to travel with my parents. And of course, the 70s, as many of you will remember, was a period where it was uh, pretty black and white. You were either Liberal and Labor, you drove a Holden or a Ford, you supported the Eastern Suburbs Roosters or you hated Manly Warringah. Uh, you, uh, you know, you liked uh, Sherbet or Skyhooks. Uh, it was, you know, there was, it was pretty uncomplicated. And of course, you remember when we had this wave of American culture hit us in our daily lives. All of a sudden we had you know, I remember when we got our colour TV in the 70s and then you see all these American TV shows that start to come on, but particularly police shows. They had a thing about Adam 12 and all these sorts of old police shows uh, and it seemed to be a very violent pace, the United States, but they also seemed to have a lot of fun. We had disco come along into our lives and every Saturday night uh, or Sunday night we'd all sit around the new colour TV and watch The Wonderful World of Disney. And, uh, you know, my sort of young boyhood dream was to go to Disneyland and went to Disneyland and learned a bit about Los Angeles and uh, it all started to, you know, I was waiting for uh, Adam 12 or Starsky and Hutch or someone to come along and, you know, and, and, and make it all real. Of course, in many cases it wasn't real, but it was the first impressions of the United States. And after I went there a couple more times, including... The first time as I went, I went as a young lawyer, I'd done my article clerkship in, uh, for an ambulance chasing law firm, it certainly wasn't King Wood Mallison's, uh, in London. And, uh, and uh, Lockerbie happened, the tragedy of Lockerbie, Pan Am. And so the law firm said, you've got to serve some papers, they were, they were you know, into a class action, you've got to serve some papers on Pan Am and we're going to fly you to the United States. And I thought, wow, that'd be fantastic, first time as an adult. And they put me on a Pan Am plane, right? Because <laughs> it was the cheapest flight and I flew up the back. And, 
went to uh, New York and then served the papers and, and then decided to take my own little trip to Washington, D.C. and just was sort of, wow. But Washington, D.C. in those days was a very violent city. And uh, I thought, yeah, this is a really interesting place. But then the career took another turn and came back to Australia, worked as a lawyer for a few years, worked in state parliament for Nick Griner and John Fay, and then uh, ended up going into parliament. And, uh, and then the only time I went to the United States was really in a business capacity after that. I thought I knew the United States because I'd been in New York and Washington and Los Angeles and San Francisco. I thought, yeah, I know what the United States is like. I'm an expert on the United States. I've been to four cities there. Uh, and it was only really when I became the ambassador of the United States that I truly came to understand the nation that really is 50 separate nations. And it's a very, very complicated place. Um, and yet so important for Australia. I mean, vitally important for Australia. And even when I got to the United States following on from Kim Beasley, I felt as though I didn't know the country. And so uh, I had a number of great conversations with Kim Beasley, with Dennis Richardson, with Michael Thorley, a number of the predecessors, went and saw Andrew Peacock. And, uh, and they gave me some really great lessons about uh, you know, how to serve as an ambassador, how to do the job I wanted to do. One of the things I discovered, you know, and Kim Beasley knows the, even to this day, probably knows the, uh, the uh, registered number of every individual tank in the US Army because he was obsessed with military history. But even then, it hadn't quite dawned on him and everyone else that really Australia had partnered with the United States uh, in, in, in battle uh, on every occasion since the, the Battle of Hamel uh, back in 1917. And um, it was a really important sense of history because we're the only country that has fought side by side with the United States in every single major conflict for 100 years. And, and that 100-year anniversary was approaching and it gave me a narrative that was very powerful in the United States, which was, we're your mates. And Jack Lew, who was Secretary of the Treasury under President Obama, um, he, uh, he said to me, he said, President Obama wanted to use the word, term mate about Australia, but he didn't know whether it was offensive or not. And I said, it's not offensive. You know, it's like buddy. It's very, very similar, but maybe a couple of levels higher in terms of commitment to each other. And uh, so we started a campaign called 100 Years of Mateship. Uh, and that narrative really resonated because it was, it, it, you know, being with the United... In, the relationship between the US and Australia is a bit like a long marriage. Sometimes we take each other for granted. And in order to keep that marriage going, you've got to have something to talk about beyond just the day-to-day. And, uh, and so when I got to Washington, D.C., it was the last year of the Obama administration, and President Obama's people kept saying, look, you're not the squeaky door, we don't need to see you. And we had very limited access. Even Kim Beasley said he didn't have much access to the White House at all. Uh, and yet I was quite determined, having chaired the G20 uh, with Tony Abbott in 2014, and having met all these world leaders, I was absolutely determined that we would not be taken for granted. So we needed to have something to talk about. And 100 years working together was just that sort of narrative that we needed. Other countries, of course, have done it over the years. I mean, the UK always talks about the special relationship. And of course, Winston Churchill uh, gave an incredible speech in Fulton, Missouri, the Iron Curtain speech, uh, where he talked about that special relationship. And of course, uh, you know, the US has been a force for good in two world wars, changed the course of two world wars to our great benefit, but still never take it for granted. So when I went to the United States uh, as ambassador, you know, I, I really didn't want to be an ambassador, to be honest. I mean, I wanted to be prime minister and, uh, you know, I was treasurer and, uh, and there was uh, the palace coup and uh, Malcolm Turnbull knocked off Tony Abbott and, uh, and uh, Malcolm called me around to his office and he said, so what would you like to do? And I said, well, I want to be treasurer. And he said, well, I can't give you that. You know, I said, well, why not? 
And he said, well, I promised it to Scott Morrison. And I went, oh, okay, right. And uh, he said, so any job, what do you want to do anywhere? And he said, do you want to be Minister for Defence? I said, well, I think the uniforms really run defence. I think the minister's just a token. And, and of course, that's not quite true with Peter Dutton. But, um, but uh, I said, no, no. And I just, over just a few days, two or three days, I said to um, Melissa, my wife, I said, I'm done. I don't trust the people around me. I, I don't like the way they've behaved. Uh, you know, I don't want to see a revolving door with prime ministers. And quite frankly, um, if I hang around, I'll just be full of the need for revenge. And I care more about my country than I do about myself in this instance. And uh, I think it's time to go. And it was, you know, I describe in the book uh, the, that moment, still a very hard moment, just sitting in my office full of boxes, signing the resignation letter to the Speaker. I didn't have to do it, but I knew I needed to do it for a whole lot of good reasons, including to stop the cancer of destabilisation and also for my own mental health. I needed to start again, you know, to find a new career. Um, and Malcolm said, look, Kim Beasley's going, do you want to go to Washington? And I, took, and I had 24 hours to make the decision. And, um, you know, which was quite, I had a young family and, you know, uprooting them. And Melissa had a, a you know, a great career as a company director in a number of companies. And it was a complete sea change. And we talked about it and just decided, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, it'd be good to get out for a bit. So there we go, off to Washington. Joe's off to Washington. And previously, I'd always sworn to myself, I'm never going to be an ambassador. I'm never going to be the sort of person who will have cocktails, talk about inane stuff, uh, and uh, use complicated language rather than simple language. And, um, and uh, therefore, you know, forget it. Um, but Washington, you know, I didn't even know how much you got paid, whether the school fees are going, I didn't know anything about that stuff. And really, I didn't care until I had to. Uh, and I didn't know anything about how the embassy was run and how big the footprint was in the United States. And when I got there, I discovered a few key facts. Number one, the embassy has around 400 people. And as ambassador, you're sort of like a mini prime minister. I mean, you've got all these departments that have representatives in the embassy. Uh, most of the departments in the government have someone in the Washington embassy. But it's not only that embassy, uh, you've got military personnel in 32 US states. A lot of people don't know how intimately involved we are with the US military. And on top of that, you've got officers, consulates in uh, New York, in Houston, Texas, in San Francisco, in uh, Los Angeles, in Honolulu, uh, in Chicago. And you're responsible for all of those people, actually under a quirk of Australian law, you are personally liable for the welfare, which is a whole other story. Um, and, uh, uh, and so it was sort of like a journey of discovery. How do I handle this? And, and all of a sudden, I'm a public servant. And the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs says to me, you know, I'm your boss now. And I thought to myself, like hell. Um, you know, even the Minister of Foreign Affairs was, you know, I'm, I'm like your boss. I'm, no, sorry, the Prime Minister's the boss. Um, and uh, I'll certainly do all the right things, but this is how I'm going to operate. And um, maybe that was arrogance, maybe a bit of chutzpah, but it was the, way I, the only way I could operate, is to have the freedom to do what I thought was necessary for the country. So Donald Trump's, uh, the campaign starts... I'm, and there's a number of stories in there in the book about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and how we nearly pulled it off, uh, a deal with the Chief of Staff to President Obama on Election Day. He and I hatched a plan to get it through. Uh, America joining TPP, that fell over with Donald Trump's election. And also where it came from, where, you know, when did I start to think that Donald Trump was going to be elected? And it was, it was very, very early on, you know, I reached out to the, to, the, to the campaign and uh, the Trump campaign and said, can we meet? And of course, Canberra was appalled. The public servants went into meltdown. Why would you ever meet Donald Trump? Why would you even engage? I said, because it's a two horse race and you never know. Oh no, we know he's not gonna win. They started to believe all the rubbish that appeared in the Australian media. And I said, hang on, I feel there's something happening out there, right? Uh, and it was reflected in the fact that, you know, Trump ended up 
losing the vote to Hillary in the top 30 cities in America, but won the election. Because something was happening out there. I could sense it. And, you know, my own political experience kicked in. Uh, because in Australian politics, we always talked about the fictional character, but real character, Betty Bankstown. You know, Betty Bankstown, who, she is a swing voter. And I said, let's find Mary Milwaukee. Let's find Mary Milwaukee. And we did. I identified Mary Milwaukee as a mum, probably in the mid-40s, uh, two children, uh, one an older boy that had done three tours of duty in Afghanistan, suffering PTSD. Uh, a daughter that she hoped one day would go to college, but she never thought she'd have the money for it. Uh, a husband who's one of the two and a half million truck drivers in America, working all sorts of hours, fearful of these new electric trucks, driverless trucks. What's his future? And she was probably, you know, might have been the son of the daughter of a a coal miner from West Virginia, who had lost his job and. Uh, um, and she worked at Walmart and got $12.50 an hour and had done so for the last seven years without a wage increase. She goes to church twice a week. There's a lot of people in the Midwest too. Uh, and she was brought up with a set of values. And for years, whoever was in Washington, let alone Hollywood and late night TV, they, they sort of made fun of her. She wasn't educated. She didn't have a future. The future's with all those bright sparks that are disrupting the business. You know, someone starts an online business called Amazon and it closes the local shop. And she says, what happened to my friend Betty that runs a local bookshop? Or, you know, she's made her feel guilty about having a gas guzzling car because she's destroying the environment. Or she's made to feel guilty even about being, you know, married and heterosexual. You know, that, that somehow all of the things that she believed in were not only you know, um, not part of the modern world, but she was even humiliated about her attitudes. And they laughed at her. And no one had given her a voice. And along was coming Donald Trump. And he was authentic. She didn't like some of his behaviour, but by God, he was the first person to be authentic, to give her a voice, to stand up for her, to even go and visit her, and to partner on the journey... And he was standing up to the Washington swamp. And he was standing up to Hollywood and all that. And he'd been incredibly successful in his own life. And she knew him because she'd watched him on TV and she'd seen his rise. And she was prepared to have a go. So there was a telling moment during that campaign. George Osborne, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, and myself, two failed finance ministers, uh, were sitting there having a bottle of uh, Kim Beasley's fine red wine. <laughs> He was a teetotaler and had a great cellar when he left. Um, and uh, we were on our second bottle watching the debate between Hillary and Donald Trump. And there was a particular moment where Donald Trump said, what do you got to lose? How's it going for you? And the majority of Americans were thinking the country was heading in the wrong direction. And when someone says to you, what do you got to lose? And you think you've got nothing to lose? It's a powerful line. And Donald Trump repeated it the next take to a big African-American audience. He said, how's it going for you? Massive unemployment, high drug use, you know, huge violence, family breakdowns. How's it going for you as an African-American community? And I know, you know, hardly any of you are going to vote for me, but what do you got to lose having a go? It's such a powerful cut through line. Of course, Donald Trump's appropriated from other people a lot of those lines. He appropriated from a New York Times journalist the line about the wall in Mexico. Um, and uh, <laughs> he appropriated the line, lock her up, when he was standing at one of those oh, way too long rallies. And someone held a sign about Hillary and said, lock her up. And he just repeated, lock her up. And then everyone started chanting. So he made that the mantra about Hillary. I mean, he was a showman. Of course he is. And, and, you know, and powerful communicator, usually at, at grade three language. But, um, but it, 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 was a, it was a message that resonated with the American people. And he won. The whole world fell off its collective chair, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, it looked really smart that I'd reached out to the campaign when 
when everyone else hadn't. And, you know, that famous email trail that, where a deputy secretary of a department in Canberra told me I was a fool for reaching out to Trump. I couldn't find it after that, right? The email disappeared <laughs> from the system, you know, which, uh, no real surprise, I guess. And, of course, everyone wanted to know what was going on. And Donald Trump, I'd always thought, was going to be exactly the same as president as he was as a campaigner. Somewhat unpredictable. Uh, gut instinct. The things that served him well made him a billionaire, gave him a beautiful family, made him a TV star. He'd, he'd, he'd use the very same skills, the very, deploy the very same uh, you know, tools as president of the United States, and it was quite the ride. Uh, and that unpredictability actually made him a hell of a more powerful president than almost any of his predecessors. In fact, the truth is Donald Trump is the most influential person in American politics probably for the last, uh, well, 60 years. Because he controls, at the moment, the Republican Party. And it's his support, not that of the Republican Party. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. He will determine who the next president of the United States is. He will have a big influence on whether the Republicans win the House and the Senate in November this year. Just as his bad influences cost elections in Georgia that cost the Republicans the Senate after the presidential election, his behaviour on January 6 caused massive reputational damage uh, to American democracy. Having said all of that, America works. America really does work. I mean, if we wouldn't be here, here, you know, right here, Sydney Institute, we wouldn't be sitting with one another if we didn't have the vaccines that came out of Operation Warp Speed, which was his initiative where he said, despite the advice, throw everything at it, back every vaccine, including AstraZeneca, American money backed AstraZeneca, he said, throw everything at it, everything we've got when even the advice was be selective. And of course, a large number of the vaccines failed. But he did it. And yet, at the same time, he was encouraging people stupidly to inject detergent or something into their bodies. I mean, that's where he lost it. And where he made it was the economy was incredibly strong. America proved resilient. And I don't think we've seen a better illustration of the resurgence of America than the leadership they've shown in relation to Ukraine and Russia. I mean, that, that comes from the fact that America had built a resilience and an ability to say enough and was not afraid to engage with the world. Uh, and, and, you know, Trump was part of that narrative. And I'd really like to come to questions and, and comments and so on. Uh, you know, the character... I, I don't want to talk about Trump all night. Uh, in the book, we talk quite a bit about China. I mean, again, one of the privileged, you know... Privileges of being the youngest in the family is we went on the second ever tour group to China. And there's a great story in it about, even if I do say so myself, uh, there's a great story there about, uh, you know, when I first went to China, and you know, 14 years of age, and uh, Beijing was, uh, you know, I mean, everyone was on push bikes. People wore green and blue suits uh, representing two arms of the PLA. And... Uh, no building was more than four stories high. There were no neon signs. Uh, you know, there was just... People came up to me and pinched my cheek because they'd never seen a white person before, let alone a white kid. I mean, and, and, and then, fast track, you know, I'm Treasurer of Australia. I'm sitting there at a conference in the Great Hall of the People. And, uh, you know, I, I, I remarked to Premier Li and the the leaders of China, that I, my eyes had seen the greatest transformation in the most number of lives in the history of humanity. And we have. Uh, but, you know, thank you for embracing capitalism, I said to them, <laughs> which didn't go so well. But, uh, <laughs> but it's the truth. Prosperity made China what it is now. And it needs prosperity to continue. And that great challenge of, of, of China versus the rest of the world or the Western world is, is something that we address in the book as well. So there are many different aspects to it. Finally, I'll just say this. I mean, the three most powerful countries in the world, and without much doubt, really, um, 
Russia, China and the United States. And all three countries were born out of really horrendous revolutions. And all three countries followed up with horrendous civil wars. And there is an inherent distrust of head office. There's an inherent distrust in Russia of Moscow. There's an inherent distrust in China of Beijing and the same in America, there's an inherent distrust of Washington. The difference between the three of them is two of those countries can only run their countries through the force and power of head office. In the case of the United States, their institutions and their constitution protect the individuals. And I would never for a second deny them the right to stand up for their freedoms because the freedom they have gives them the hope, the hope they have. And, you know, I, I see time and time again, I, I, I recall, uh, you know, going into a diner in, in Los Angeles and there was a, a waitress I started to chat to. She had really bad skin. And, you know, a friend of mine is one of the leading plastic surgeons in Hollywood. And, you know, I just, I just asked her what she's doing. She wanted to be an actress, but she was working three shifts to try and get the money to get her, her cosmetic surgery to cover. And I said, all right. And she said, I have a little girl as well, a little daughter. And I'm a single mother. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. And she said, you know, I might not get to Australia, but I really hope she does. In fact, I want to make sure she does. She can have whatever dream she wants. That's the glue that holds that country together is hope. That one day your daughter could be president of the United States, could go to college, could be whatever she wants to be. And the US makes that dream possible. And when it doesn't, it will fall apart. And that's why the power in America actually isn't in Washington. It's in the community. It's in all communities. And that's a stark contrast to China and Russia, but many other countries around the world. So uh, lots of questions, comments. Uh, there are many aspects to this book that uh, I haven't addressed. But again, I want to thank, uh, you know, I want to thank all of you. And I want to thank you because I would never have had the opportunity to experience any of this without the support of the Australian community. You know, it was always a gift being elected to Parliament, was a gift from my community in North Sydney. Being a minister or on the front bench for 17 years was a gift of my party and the prime ministers that I served and the leaders I served. And of course, being ambassador was a gift to the Australian people and uh, I'm very appreciative of that. And what I want to try and do through the book is to give you some insights into how things really work both in Australia and in the United States. Thanks, Jared. Thank you. So talk a little bit about Joe Biden. I know he's covered in your book as is President Obama, but you would have known President Biden when he was vice president, I assume. Um, if you look back at some of the videos from the, uh, the primary debates, he doesn't look quite the man that he was even 18 months ago. So how did you find him and what kind of dealings did you, did you have with him? Well, Joe, Joe Biden is a very decent guy. He's sort of a traditional senator, respectful of both sides, um, likes working together to get solutions, incredibly experienced. Every senator sort of thinks they should be president of the United States. Uh, and it turns out he, he became vice president and president. Um, but, but, you know, I'm, I think I'm stunned at his numbers and his low approval ratings because he, he's not a hated figure. He's not vilified, but he's just let people down. And I think people forget they really, you know, a lot of people voted for Joe Biden in order to get rid of Donald Trump. Um, but they also thought he'd be a middle ground president, you know, predictable, stable, nothing dramatic. Uh, and he actually had a very, uh, he's had a, quite a left-wing agenda, uh, which is more in keeping with Bernie Sanders' agenda or, or, or uh, AOC's agenda rather than the middle ground agenda. And when people like Senator Joe Manchin, who's, you know, in Washington we call him President Manchin because he's the deciding vote in the Senate. He's a Democrat from 
West Virginia. He also happens to be a friend of mine. Wears Aaron Williams boots, likes the odd cigar, and uh, and um, we spent a bit of time together. And he just, you know, he just identifies those issues of Mary Milwaukee, and he can see that the agenda from Biden was just, it, it was the antithesis that, that of, of everything Mary Milwaukee hoped for, and uh, and therefore. Biden couldn't get big parts of his agenda through. Big taxing, big spending agenda. So, uh, you know, um, I was speaking to Tony Abbott today and he said to me, mate, that's a great read. Mate, that's a great read. Um, he said, I think you're a little soft on Joe Biden. I said, it was finished January. I said, you know, events unfold. It's very hard to run commentary. But I'm not, you know, going to vilify Joe Biden because I think he's a, a decent guy. I think he's handled Ukraine very well. I think, in fact, the US has handled it exceptionally well. And it's actually brought all the good people together. Uh, and it was the first time that you didn't see the fractured partisanship that uh, has previously been part of it. No, no, I'll do this. Oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> You're no longer ambassador. We're going to go with Michael, then we're going to go here, and then we're going down there. So, OK, then up the back. All right. Thanks, Sherrod. And uh, Joe, is that working? No. Hello. Oh, there you go. Um, Joe, great to see you. Yeah, welcome back to these shores and um, just wonder wonderful to hear you. May I say, I thought that was just a magnificent address and I'm reminded of the old line, which I heard many years ago, that a, a true diplomat is someone who thinks twice before he says nothing. So I just, I just want to say I'm very glad you didn't become a true diplomat. Well, that's all right. The title's somewhat ironic because everyone that knows me knows I'm not terribly diplomatic. <laughs> Joe, as, as, you, as you may know, well, you do know because I, I mentioned it to you earlier, yeah. um, there are a number of us who are immersed in the process of trying to achieve something that is, is, is pretty difficult and that is the reform of political fundraising in Australia. You talk about cut-through lines and I think what we collectively, and it's a, it's a, a cross-party group that we've got together, have discovered that there is no sort of more potent cut-through line when you're talking about political fundraising than to say we want to stop the Americanisation of, Australia, of, of, of Australian politics. Now, if Michael, I could just be say... Great. I don't, I don't think American politics is all bad, but can you, from, from your perspective, do, do, you, do you relate to that line, stopping the Americanisation of Australian politics, and what in particular do you think we should cherry-pick from the good and the bad? Well, um, look, I think we've got a fantastic system compared to the United States. Um, we Compulsory voting means that we don't have to fight for the extremes to go out and vote. And I think that is really, really important. I mean, in America, you have to fire up your base. And that's why everyone seems to take an extreme position because they want the base to turn out. Whereas in Australia, you know, whilst you talk about your base, you, you don't have to spend a lot of money and to put a lot of effort in and take extremist positions to get them to vote. You know, they have to vote. And the middle ground in Australia tends to decide the outcomes of the election. Secondly, having an Australian Electoral Commission that determines the boundaries is very important. I mean, they are manipulated in the United States. Um, and I just might add, the fraud in the United States election is always going to be voter suppression, coming back to voluntary voting. I mean, it's outrageous. And what happened in the South under the Democrats and happened in the last election in part under the Republicans was just outrageous. I mean, the concept of voter suppression, I think, is, is fraudulent. Um, and um, in terms of um, money, I mean, you know, it is good to have public funding, but it's also good, I think it's necessary to have some private funding at elections as well because it keeps people engaged and they feel as though they can influence. I think one of the things, one of the problems in my own party, in the Liberal Party, is... People join, they say, well, what, what are we joining for? Because we can't influence policy. Uh, you know, ask us how to hand, hand out how to vote. And, you know, you're relying on others for fundraising. And, you know, so you, you can't remove the community from politics. And one of the things that's changed in American politics is the vast number of people that give small amounts of money 
which is much easier. And I think that's a good story. I think that's a good story uh, in American politics. Question there. Yeah, Paul Nettlebeck. Hi, Paul. Thank you, Joe. Welcome back. Thank you. Welcome. You've got to speak into the microphone. Okay, okay. it's on now. Uh, Paul Nettlebeck, uh, welcome back. Thanks, and, Paul. Uh, thank you for writing the book. As a follow-on to Jared's question and your comment on Joe Biden letting the people down, um, can you let us know the level of buyer's remorse and the likelihood of Trump coming back? <coughs> Who's going to be the next president of the US and what will happen after the yeah. year term? So in the book, you know, uh, Leo remembers I was tortured about this, about whether I say that Trump will run again or won't run again. I heard on the side that he wouldn't run again because the worst thing Donald Trump can ever say about any human being is they're a loser. He, it's, the, it's, it's his go-to word for uh, demonising and, and putting down people. Um, and that's why he refuses to accept the result of the last election because he would be a loser. So he says, I actually won the election. Right, even though he lost it. Um, his great fear would be being a two-time loser. First time someone runs for president of the United States and loses twice. Um, and so that would be very much at the back of his mind, or maybe at the forefront of it. Um, but if he wants a Republican nomination at this point, he can get it. He controls the party. Um, there is a long line of potential candidates in the Republican Party uh, that could run. You know, you've got Trump himself, then you've got a whole lot of Trump administration officials like Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, and then you've got a cohort of senators from Tom Cotton and Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio, uh, you know, who'll run. Uh, and, uh, and then you're going to have governors uh, and ex-governors. I mean, I think the most formidable candidate is Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, but you've got Greg Abbott, you've got a few others that could run as well. And then you've got the celebrities. Uh, and yes, you can have very celebrities run. Who knows who they are? Um, but not obviously the, the most obvious ones. Um, but in the Democrats, you know, again, Trump will be looking at the Democrats, say, who's going to run for the Democrats? And the most formidable candidate, in my view, they had was a former governor of Virginia called Terry McAuliffe. And Terry's a mate of mine and, you know... A, Gruff character, um, but, you know, really effective, high energy, would have really given Trump a run for his money if, uh, if he got the... But he lost the Virginia governor's race to another man of mine, Glenn Youngkin, who was the head of Carlisle, in a, in a boil over result. Therefore, who's going to run? And, and Joe Biden, what's happening is in the White House, um, the people around Joe Biden are sort of, you know pushing Kamala Harris down because they don't want a credible daily alternative to, to uh, Joe Biden if he has some deterioration in his health or whatever. So they don't want to have any competition. They want, don't want to even talk about succession because he'll be lame duck immediately. So, you know, the final thing is, I, I don't know about you, but I get the distinct impression Joe Biden won't run again. Just looking at him every day in press conferences and the pressure of office. I mean, the, the job of President of the United States is beyond the capacity of any one human being because they're expected to solve everyone's problems all around the world now. And it's just impossible. So the pressure of the job is, is phenomenal, um, let alone on someone who's, you know, uh, not, as, not as strong as, as might expect. Love. Joe, do you um, better speak into it? Do you accept uh, the... Yeah. Sorry, just leave the microphone on now. Leave it on, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Joe, love, thanks for your address. Uh, Thank do you, you accept the proposition of the, the Trump movement on behalf of the Mary Milwaukee's that there's a swap in Washington of elites, that both sides of politics are engaged in essentially the managed decline of the United States and, and hence the need for the Trump movement? Uh, <clears throat> so Washington, I, I'm, I'm not sure about swamp, um, although it gets very hot in summer, but, uh, um, but it, it is, uh, I think Washington, many, many people in Washington became detached from the rest of America. Uh, and, you know, it's a bit like Canberra, where it's its own community. 
You know, I don't want to disparage Canberra, but, you know, I, I respect most of the people, particularly the journalists that go out and, 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 and visit other parts of the country. And um, I think that, that fundamentally, you know, what Donald Trump did, is, it was like a valve, like a, a, a pressure valve going off. And it completely discombobulated Washington. And there was a resistance movement from the day he was elected. I mean, that's how the leaked phone call between Trumbull and, uh, Trumbull, Turnbull and Trump got out there, right? Um, uh, I mean, it was someone in, in, and it never happened. It was unprecedented. And, you know, it worked to my advantage, but people in the Trump administration couldn't go to a restaurant in Washington without people just being rude to them, right? And, and, and you know, so I said, like, to the White House, I said to the Chief of Staff, mate, to, to Mick Mulvaney, I said, Mick, I know it's huge pressure on you guys and you've got a great team in the White House, just come over to my place. No one else there. I'll put on some grog, some food, bring your secretaries, your, your, your the guy, you know, young kids running around, bring them all, come in and, and, and spend a night at my place. We'll have a barbecue and so on. They were elated, absolutely elated because... Anyone in Washington that says they were working in the Trump White House, let alone the administration, was, was pummeled, you know. And, and in fact, even to this day, um, you know, a prominent journalist was telling me that she'd go on, on dates. And as soon as she said she was, you know, a supporter of Trump or believed in Trump, the, the dates would, would, she'd never hear, hear from them again, right? And, and it's still, you know, wow, I mean, visceral. So yes, it needs a clean out, and maybe it still needs a clean out, and that's to the benefit of the American people. Malcolm, uh, Joe, you mentioned the special relationship between uh, Britain and the U.S. and uh, Trump, in effect, got the British ambassador recalled. Right? Yeah, probably a friend of yours. That must have been a big diplomatic incident at the time. Well, that's why I didn't write cables, and you know, uh, we had code. People knew if it was my view, uh, and others in the embassy actually put their names to it. But, and I would speak to Malcolm Turnbull daily. Yeah, you know, I mean, we'd speak daily, often. Um, um, you know, uh, um, often more, often daily. And uh, and I would speak to ministers or secretaries of department. I'd come back to Canberra and go and see them face to face. I wouldn't put anything in writing. And Kim Durek, who was the British ambassador in Washington made the grave error of putting in a cable that only went to four or five people. That he thought the Trump White House was a mess, which of course it was. Um, and blah, blah, blah. Someone back in London leaked it to the local papers. It was front page. Donald Trump said, I will not, in my administration, no one will deal with the British ambassador or the embassy until he's gone. But you know what? I mean, so uh, he was a failure. What do they do in Britain? They knight him and then they elevate him to the House of Lords. And you know, me, I go off and work in small business and start to earn an honest crust for the first time. So, you know, it's quite the contrast, really. The British have a great way of dealing with these things. We're going there, and then we're going to Jay. Okay, here, here. Jay, yeah, good to see you. Again. How are you? Um, mate, you, you talked about. Trump in some ways being authentic, yeah. um, yes, and whether we like him or not, and his, his behaviour, we can all question. <coughs> but to what extent, or, or what's your views in terms of the way that the media, both in America and here, portrayed him and what would appear to be um, take a set against him? I'd, interested in, in, in what your views are on that. Um, whether we like him or not. Yeah. Um, I think it was easier to be critical of him from afar because of his erratic behaviour and because he, you know, he said things and did things that were, like, outrageous. Um, but you didn't feel the benefits of it. In America, Mary Milwaukee got a pay rise saw her 401k, uh, you know, uh, increase dramatically. Um, 
she had more money in her pocket. Her husband had job, more job certainty and got a wage increase. Uh, and her daughter might have had a better chance of getting to college and Trump made it clear he didn't want to send her son to Afghanistan anymore. So he was well on the path of pulling out of Afghanistan. Um, so, you know, there was a, a telling moment in Reno, Nevada. You know, I, we were, Reno's the capital of Nevada and next day I was having lunch with the governor and we got there the night before. And of course, the only place you can stay is usually one of those sort of casino hotels. And I went down, I went just, you know, we had dinner in the, and there was just one table that was operating in this casino. It was pretty dingy. And, um, uh, and I just thought I'd go along and hear the croupier was in a, a, a conversation with a woman that uh, was wearing a, um, a Walmart top, you know, and um, a lady was sitting there having a gamble and the other lady overseeing the croupier was there and they were engaged in a conversation about politics, so I just sat there and pretended to play a bit. And um, she said, you know, I don't like Trump. And they went, yeah, we don't like But she said, you know, I've got money in the bank for the first time. She shouldn't have been at the table, arguably. But um, she said, you know, I've got my 401k has doubled in value. You know, it's the equivalent of superannuation. And, and she said, you know, all of a sudden, I, I've got job security. I mean, it was the real telling of the story. And when you hear those people say it, you go, yeah, something's happening. You know, it's there. Um, if COVID hadn't come along, no doubt Trump would have been re-elected. No doubt in my mind. Um, and if he hadn't have screwed up COVID, he would have, he would have been re-elected. But he just, that telling moment when he drove that, you know, came out of hospital, he had the sympathy of the nation. And, you know, he came out of hospital trying to be Superman and jumped into the car, endangered all his staff just to wave from the car to his, his uh, supporters outside the hospital. And I thought, oh, my God, you don't get it. What you're saying is, my health is more important than your health. That's the moment. That's the telling moment that he lost it. And that was a telling moment, Mary Milwaukee says, if he doesn't care about the people around him in those cars, and he doesn't care about the staff in the hospital, he's not caring about me. Now we're getting close here, and we've got a few notes here. It's here, Jay. No. Okay, well, let's go there and then we'll go here. Okay. I'll, I'll be humble. No, 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 it's all right. Uh, just a quick question on the future of the Republican Party, because uh, you said it's in the total thrall of Donald Trump. He has complete control over it. There are a lot of characters that we see reported on here in Australia who echo his playbook in large part. What do you think the future of the Republican Party is? Is it going to revert back to what we once knew was the Republican Party or is it forever changed? Oh, no, I don't think anything's forever, <laughs> not in this world. Um, you know, there are sort of like the Bush Republicans and then there are, you know, the Donald Trump Republicans. Being, just watch Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. I mean, he is, he's got it right. He's very popular in Florida. He was sort of defined on COVID, you know, doesn't like the mask mandate. Int really interesting debate about, you know, this um, issue about, you know, um, sexuality and school teachings and so on. Um, and he's in a bit of a battle with Disney on that. Um, but he's actually, you know, uh, I mean, he's quite, he's a formidable communicator he, he, and he's proven. And I'm sort of watching how he manages Donald Trump because Donald Trump doesn't like rivals. And if DeSantis... You know, DeSantis has a platform as governor that Donald Trump doesn't have these days. And, you know, it'll be in really interesting to see how it plays out over the next uh, two years. And, and in a sense, if DeSantis brings it a bit away from the cult of Trump, uh, then there's hope for the, for, the, for, the, for the Republican side that they can chart a more middle ground. James, question there. We've got to be brief, OK? Yes, very brief. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Good to hear you again. And... Uh, if you were free to preach this Sunday at Mill Sydney, you'd be welcome there. Okay. Um, what's your perception coming back to Australia then of what it's been like uh, to uh, work in that pond and come back where there's a lot of animosity, there's a lot of personal rancor, uh, there are rich people putting money into places and people we ever thought would happen. Uh, is there a sort of like a, when you've come back, you've said, oh, this is different. 
What's different and what do you think about? What's different? Um, well, I still really live the majority of the year in Washington, D.C. And, you know, and travel between the two countries. Um, Australians, you know, might not want to hear this, but they're, you know, we've got the best country on earth, right? I mean, you know, we, we, we didn't suffer the same problems of COVID as most other countries. Uh, we've got a very strong economy. People have jobs. Of course, we've got inflation, which is a challenge for people. But, you know, at the end of the day, we've also got our freedom. We've managed to come through all this. And the upheaval, I mean, I was there when the bodies were piling up in New York. It's scary. I was, I was there when, you know, I drove from Washington to New York and there was hardly any cars on the road. I was there and, you know, my family was there when, when COVID hit DC and, a, you know, it was like, what the hell happened? And we rode our bikes down to the mall, to the Lincoln Memorial, and my son rode his push bike in that famous pond that had been drained and the, in the middle of the day and there was no one around. We were driving on the roads of DC and there were no cars. It was like a ghost town with bright skies the middle of the day. Like nothing I've ever seen in my life. It was like the end of the world. And, and then, you, you know, when they left, I went to New York and genuinely the bodies were in the streets. You know, they were piling up outside the hospitals. They couldn't get enough trucks there. And people were scared and there were massive mental health issues and a whole range of things happening. And, and you know, I was, we were desperate for the family to get back to Australia, you know? And it was not easy. But, God, we, you know, we're lucky, but we made our luck in Australia. We made our luck in Australia. So... You know, you're not going to hear me critical of, of Australia at the moment. I mean, we're an ambitious nation. Of course, we, we're not the biggest capital market in the world. We're not the biggest, you know, of, of whatever. But by God, we're batting above our weight in global affairs. And we are, we've, we've got plans for the future. And I'm very positive about Australia. Final question off the bat. Hey, uh, Matt Cross. Yes, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, if you could just expand a bit on uh, you working with the Obama White House, particularly Barack Obama himself, like you have with Trump, and how much responsibility do you think the Obama White House has to the election of Trump? You know, it's quite interesting because quite a few people that voted for Trump the first time cited Obamacare as a reason why they voted for Trump. Now, I, I happen to think a safety net is really important, right? But in America, there was a, there's been a culture that you have to save and pay for your own welfare, right? So particularly on college fees, right? I mean, you know, it shouldn't, you shouldn't have an education system that discriminates on the basis of wealth. But the people that went through college, paid their fees, and pay them off, and then had to buy a house and pay that off and all that sort of stuff... They are the most uh, aggro about the thought that someone doesn't have to pay college fees because they had to go through that. So why shouldn't the next generation earn their right to go to college? And it's a bit the same with healthcare because healthcare is expensive. In the US, um, you know, my healthcare bill through Bondi Partners uh, works out, and when the family were there, it was around 38000 a year US for the same coverage I have in Australia. Right, with Medicare levy and, and, and you know that and private health insurance in Australia, it's nothing like that, obviously. Um, so when they were left, I was a little bit relieved <laughs> financially, but you know, for a lot of people in America, it's really expensive, and the cost of, of, of healthcare is very, very expensive. Um, yet they voted against it, and, and there are instances where, you know, the cool dude, Barack Obama, uh, was just a little too cool for school. You know, and a bit too cool for... she. You know, Mary Milwaukee liked the idea that he could be elected. It reminded Americans that even with black skin, you could be president of the United States. No one's precluded. But also at the same time, uh, you know, they didn't like the idea that someone in the White House was telling them how they should lead their lives. Just a final quick question. Um, the Australia-UK-United States Agreement about submarines and related matters... <coughs> 
who runs the United States? I mean, how did that get through? It was never leaked. At, at it was amazing. I mean, it, it, and to, yeah. who would have driven that decision? Not the president, presumably. What? Oh no, I think you know. I think Scott Morrison's great credit. This this is a totemic agreement, and uh, you know, it's not just submarines. That's one tranche, but all these other areas: artificial intelligence, hypersonics. Uh, cyber warfare, all these other elements are the bigger play than even submarines, and yet submarines was the iconic divisive issue, particularly with the French. But, you know, the bottom line is, as I understand it, Scott Morrison approached Boris Johnson and developed the idea, and then both of them worked on President Biden, and there was enough support in the US system from people like Jake Sullivan, Kurt Campbell, who know Australia well, and they encouraged it, and, it, and that's how it came up. Remarkable. It didn't leak. A lot of people knew about it. It was a uh, totemic moment in, in diplomacy. And, uh, I mean, it, it really does have a profound impact on Australia going into the future. Many thanks. Um, look, we, we could continue, but uh, we, we always finish on time. So I just want to say um, thanks to Joe Hockey before I, I do. Um, the book's on sale tonight, I'm sure. Joe Hockey's willing to sign uh, copies and uh, with uh, um, um, it's over there on the far table. And just uh, formally, look, uh, Anne and I were in uh, Washington in the early days of your uh, ambassadorship and we observed then you were going to be a very fine ambassador and I think you've been a terrific ambassador for Australia and you've demonstrated some of those skills tonight with your frankness and your humour. And... Um, your honesty about these matters. So uh, I'm sure the book will go well. Tony Abbott, if uh, Tony Abbott said it's a good read, it's a good read. I was surprised. Well, he's a harsh critic. Well, he's a harsh critic, but he's a good writer. He he knows what good writing is. And he, Tony's a highly skilled writer. So well done on the book, and thanks for tonight, and good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay.